I wonder if you can name the film, okay? Let me test your knowledge. So there's a driver, he's driving a coach, and he's not paying very much attention to the road. He's driving on a, a perilous, winding mountain route. You there yet? He loses concentration, and part of the bus goes over the edge of the cliff. Yes, Italian job, very good. So there's a, there's a heavy load of gold at one end of the bus, and it's teetering, you've got the motley crew at the other end of the bus, and they can't get off the bus, they can't get the gold, and they're stuck. And uh, the leader, Charlie Croker, played by Michael Caine, is sprawled out on the floor, and he turns and says, hang on a minute, lads, I've got a great idea. Roll credits. It is a brilliant, brilliant, and very literal, cliffhanger at the end of the original Italian job. But it's so rare in film today to have proper cliffhangers because, you know, modern audiences, they like to have the story tied off all neatly and resolved. Um, but so you don't get them very much in Hollywood unless there's a sequel planned and it's already in production and so they'll give you a cliffhanger so you go and watch the next one. Well, of course, it's the very opposite with TV series. If you watch anything on Netflix or Amazon Prime or anything like that, it seems compulsory, even when they're about to cancel the series, it seems it's compulsory to end the series on a cliffhanger just so that you'll go and buy the next one um, or watch the next one uh, when it comes. Now, for those of us who are used to old-fashioned TV, you know, kind of when there's only three or four or five channels, uh, well, then cliffhangers would happen almost every week, wouldn't they? So that you'd not miss an episode of your favourite show, whether that was Doctor Who or your favourite soap. Now, the very best kind of cliffhangers draw you into the story. They have you wondering and pondering and, and reflecting on what's going to happen next. You, you can't stop thinking about it through the week. Well, Mark's account of Jesus' death, life and resurrection ends very suddenly with the announcement of the resurrection. It's a brilliant cliffhanger. It's very sudden and abrupt on purpose. Because Mark is asking us, the reader or listener, what is our response to the news that Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty? Is it faith or is it fear? Mark introduces us to some courageous women. These were women who were standing at the foot of Jesus' cross as he died. They were there when he was buried and now they are the first to his tomb. But what they see next is too overwhelming, too unexpected. They go to anoint Jesus' body. They were expecting to find a corpse. And as they're going along, they, they're talking to one another and they're saying, who's going to move the stone for us? And which might think strange. Why have you even set out in the first place if you don't know how the stone's going to be moved? Well, maybe it was in their grief they were just doing something strange or, or maybe it was just a kind of a slightly hopeless act of final devotion to the one who they'd hoped, they thought was going to be the saviour and Lord. But they'd seen... Jesus laid in the tomb and their hopes in him were extinguished. The grave does tend to have that effect on our hope. But as they get to the tomb, the stone is rolled away. There's an angel sitting there, appearing as a man dressed in white and they're shocked, they're alarmed. The angel tries to calm them. He knows why they've come, you're seeking Jesus. Jesus. And he shares the world-shattering good news. He has risen. And he gives the women a brilliant task of witness to, to, mess, to send this message. To gather the disciples and to meet with Jesus in Galilee, just as he says. But it's all too much. It's too overwhelming. It's too unexpected. Verse 8 says... And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Trembling, astonished, afraid. Roll credits. Now, of course, we know it's not the end of the story. 
We know that the women did go eventually and tell the disciples and went around spreading the good news and Jesus met them and all sorts of other things happened. Otherwise, Mark would have never written his account and the word never would have come to us. But the cliffhanger asks of the listener, what will be your response, faith or fear? Now, Mark has such a cliffhanger ending. Some people have wondered, maybe the end of Mark's gospel got lost. Maybe he wrote more and it kind of got got lost to time. Which is why we have verses 9 to 20. That was early scribes, early Christians, adding to the end of Mark's gospel, kind of finishing off the ending. But it's not part of the original text of the Bible, which is why we didn't read it um, this morning. Mark does end abruptly, but he tells us enough. The tomb is empty. Jesus isn't there. He is risen. And so for the rest of our um, time in this short sermon, we're going to think about the significance of the resurrection. And we're going to do so with the help of Iceland. That's right, the help of Iceland. Are are you aware of the the not crossbun controversy? Anyone come across that? A few nods. Well, this was just a genius marketing stunt, okay, if you, if you didn't, weren't aware of it. So what Iceland did is, they made some sticky buns and they put a tick on them instead of a cross, okay? And then they, they posted all over social media and they sat back and waited for the huge media storm and it appeared on major news channels, it appeared in um, major um, um, papers as well. All this free advertising for Iceland. And then they backtrack, which is, of course, what they always plan to do. And now they've sold lots and lots of hot cross buns to people who wandered into Iceland, coming to see what all the fuss is about. Genius. I mean, as Christian believers, if you're, if you're a Christian believer, you, you, we should be amazed that our society considers acceptable to have the cross so in all over, in so many places in our society, because it's a cruel execution method. The Romans dreamt up the cross as the worst way to execute someone so that the crimes that they were put to death for would never be repeated. And yet it's such a a common, such a ubiquitous symbol, it appears on sweet buns for Easter and no one blinks an eyelid. Such is the significance of the cross of Christ and the impact of Christianity on our culture. Well, hand in hand with Jesus' cross is his resurrection. Those two things go inseparably together. And so we're going to run just for a little bit with the tick. The resurrection is a huge tick for Jesus in at least three ways. So what kinds of tick are there? Well, there's the tick where you have a a tick list as you mark something off as you've done it. Um, With the family, I'm going camping up in the lakes tomorrow and we've got a packing list to make sure all the millions of things that we need to remember, we'll tick them off as we've done it and that we say we've packed it. Well, the resurrection is a huge tick showing that Jesus did what he said he was going to do. Again and again, Jesus said to his closest followers, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and on the third, I'm going to rise. Mark records three distinct um, times when Jesus said that really deliberately to his disciples. And then in Jesus' public teaching as well, so in John's Gospel, when um, when Jesus says that he's the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep, he says he has the authority to take it back up again. And there are many, many more examples when Jesus says, look, he's going to rise again. But no one believed him. That's why the women go to the tomb expecting to find a corpse. But what Jesus says, he fulfills. Tick. The resurrection shows that none of Jesus' words will ever fail. Every promise of God is yes in Jesus because he is alive. And so if your faith is in him, if you you put your faith in him, if you put your life into his hands, he is never going to let you down. Tick. Done. Done. A tick is also the opposite of a cross. When you get something right, you get a tick. When you get something wrong, you get a cross. Now, we're thankful it's the Easter holidays now in our house, but most school days, as we're running around getting school bags and things ready, there's always the question of, have you done your spellings? 
No, okay, right, fine. Well, let's do another round of the spellings now. So, you know, you read out the spellings and the child writes them down. And then afterwards, they look at the correct answers and they compare them, right? Okay, got that one, tick, tick, tick. Oh, they've missed an L out from that word. Okay, so cross, tick, tick. Well, the resurrection is a huge tick over Jesus' life and mission. The resurrection vindicates Jesus. That the cross wasn't an accident, it was the right thing. That Jesus really did live a perfectly righteous life. The resurrection happened because Jesus couldn't stay dead. It would have been unjust for someone who's never done anything wrong and has perfectly loved God and loved his neighbour. Well, if he remained dead, the, the moral scaffold of the universe would have collapsed. Jesus went through the cross to receive the tick of the resurrection. It shows that his sacrifice of his perfect life on the cross as our substitute was accepted by God. That he really died in our place, bearing our guilt, our shame, our sin, so that we might receive his perfect life and rewards. Jesus took our cross so that we might receive his tick. Jesus' mission was a complete success and the resurrection proves it. Jesus is alive and so we can have life in him forever. Eternal life starts now, knowing Jesus now as saviour, lord and friend. And he's the only one who can take us by the hand and lead us through death into his presence forever. Tick, Jesus Got it right, mission accomplished. And then thirdly, we have a tick as a sign of, of verification or proof. What I mean is, you know, you go to make a, a contactless payment with your card and you tap the machine, and then often a kind of a big tick will appear in a circle to show, yeah, your card's been verified. Or if you're on social media, on the platform X, which used to be known as Twitter, you could get a blue tick next to your name to show that you're a real person rather than some kind of you know, impersonator or kind of spoof account of you or the celebrity or whoever it is. Well, the resurrection is a huge tick for Jesus' identity. Only the Son of God in the flesh could beat the grave. No other person in history has faced death and come out the victor. Only Jesus. So the resurrection verifies, it proves who Jesus is. He really is the Christ, the Son of God. And that's what Mark wants everyone to know. That's the good news he shares in his account of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. Mark 1, Mark chapter 1 verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark thinks it's the best news in the world that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised King, that he is God come down to save us. We meet Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, and in chapter 8, verse 29, it's on his lips. You are the Christ. At that point in the story, Peter finally realises who Jesus is. And then in Mark chapter 15, just before what we've read, as Jesus is hanging and dying on the cross, the executioner, the Roman centurion, looks up and says, surely this man was the son of God, as he sees how Jesus dies. So who do you say Jesus is? Look at the empty tomb. He is alive. Tick. Proof that Jesus really is who he says he is. Well, in our house, I think we will still stick with traditional hot cross buns. But I quite like the tick minus the fake controversy. Jesus said he'd rise, and he did. Tick. Jesus' mission was to rescue all those who trust in him by sacrificing himself. And that mission was a success. Tick. Jesus really is the Son of God who we can know and love forever. Tick. If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian believer or just not sure about these things, the real question is, what do you make of Jesus? 
Do you find yourself drawn to him, intrigued by the hope that he offers as he stands as the victor over the grave? Well, as he does so, he says, put your life into my hands and I'll fill you with my life. You got questions about these things? Talk to a Christian that you know. Pick up one of the accounts of Jesus' life at your, uh, um, for yourself at home. You can read it free um, on the internet. Or come along to our 3 to one course. Fill in one of those yellow cards. Come along on Tuesday the 16th of April. Give it a try and see what Jesus' claims are and what you make of them for yourself. And for those of us who gathered this morning as Christians on this Easter Sunday morning, the resurrection is a challenge for us. Are we living by faith or by fear? Is the resurrection of Jesus the foundation of your hope so that you know that your earthly story won't end in death but is your gateway to even greater life? Is the resurrection of Jesus the best news in the world for everyone? Or is it just a private belief that can't stand up in the public square? Is Jesus' resurrection motivation enough to live and to speak and to make Jesus known to a dark and hopeless world? Listen again to what the angel says. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Jesus is risen. Let faith drive out fear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus is alive. That what he said, he did. That his mission was a success as he died and rose again, that we might know and love you. And that he really is your son, who can give us eternal life. Who we can walk with as saviour, lord and friend. Help us today, this week and always, to live in the power of Jesus' resurrection. We ask for his name's sake. Amen.